In September 1996, manga artist Takahashi Kazuki published the first chapter of his newest manga Yu-Gi-Oh! in Weekly Shonen Jump magazine. Takahashi's concept for the series was simple. Every week the cast played a different game, with the physically weak protagonist Muto Yugi magically transforming into his second self to become a master gamer and defeat that week's antagonist before punishing them for their crimes, whether they were a high school bully, an abusive teacher, or an escaped convict. While the premise was successful enough with Takahashi's target audience, it took until November for the series to really take off. Takahashi adapted the western trading card game Magic the Gathering into the game of the week for Yu-Gi-Oh's ninth chapter, creating a game called Magic and Wizards that played fast and loose with its rules to portray something that would be exciting to see illustrated. Magic and Wizards was a fairly simple game, scaled up to a level that would be engaging for Shonen Jump's young target audience. Rather than the 20 life of magic, both players began with 2,000 life points, and monsters had attack and defense power on a similar 1,000 point scale. The core of the game was the turn-to-turn -turn point exchanges between monsters. Instead of having tapped and untapped positions, monsters could be in attack or defense mode. If two attack mode monsters battled, the difference in attack points was subtracted from the losing player's life points, and the defeated monster was destroyed. A defense mode monster with less defense than the attacker would still be destroyed, but its owner would take no damage to their LP, and if the defense mode monster had higher defense than the attacker's attack, the attacking player would take the difference in points as damage, but their monster would survive on the field. Each player supported their monster cards with magic cards that enhanced their strength, like giant growth and dark energy, and could be set face down to play later, or on the opponent's turn rather than immediately. The magic and wizards concept gave Takahashi's manga a much-needed boost, with countless fans writing in to ask more about the game, leading Takahashi to incorporate villain of the week Kaiba Seto into the greater plot as Yugi's rival, and bring magic and wizards back both for the grand finale of the current arc, Death T, and as the focal game for an entire new arc, Duelist Kingdom. Duelist Kingdom introduced both field magic effects that could power up monsters of the right attribute, and trap cards that had to be set face down to use in response to the opponent's attack or card effect. These ideas showed considerable inspiration from the real-world TCG Monster Collection, and Takahashi used the opportunity to expand on his fictional game with cards like the defense-blocking Stop Defense and Alluring Eyeshadow, magic and trap destroyers like the Reaper of the Cards, D-Spell, and Harpy's Feather Duster, attack nullifiers, monsters created through fusing other monsters together, and cards that stole effects like Grave Robber and Doppelganger. He also clarified certain points, like how players would instantly lose if they didn't play any cards at all on their turn. And the more Takashi wrote, the more fans he got. Within a year, his publisher, Shueisha, was approached for merchandising deals with Bandai, Toei, and Amada, culminating in a 1998 Toei anime series featuring Neon Genesis Evangelion star Ogata Megumi as Yugi. Toei put Magic and Wizards front and center in this adaptation, reshuffling the order of events so that Kaiba would appear earlier along with Magic and Wizards, now rechristened Duel Monsters. While it still featured the M&W initials, Duel Monsters was played much more frequently in this anime series, with new antagonists introduced as minions of Kaiba coming after Yugi to play the game. Toei and their partner Bandai aggressively marketed the series with licensed merchandise, creating stickers, playing cards, posters, and most important of all, their very own trading card game, featuring a mix of cards from the manga and new ones created for the TV anime. Which, admittedly, wasn't very good. The card game didn't have all that much to do with the game played in the manga or the anime, having no life points and instead being a game about defeating each other's monsters until both players ran out of cards, and counting up the level stars of the monsters defeated to win the overall game. Like a lot of TCGs released in the wake of Pokemon's success, there was no organized play or tournament system in place, and this contributed to the way Bandai's game fizzled after only a few expansions. They treated these cards more as a collectible and expendable toy rather than a lifestyle game as Monster Collection and Pokemon had been, and its most important contribution was actually in how it established the infrastructure for card games to come. Rather than distributing the game using a sealed booster box model, Bandai distributed their Yu-Gi-Oh cards by repurposing the Cardass vending machines they had been using to distribute collectible cards since 1988. Many storefronts already had Cardass machines available at the time, so just as they had done for the Pokemon Trading Card Games vending machine series, they simply swapped out the contents and front displays of their machines with those for Yu-Gi-Oh. However, Cardass cards did not follow standard playing card sizes as Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, and Moncole had. 
In order to fit through the standard Cardass slot rather than use a special jumbo Cardass like Pokemon, Bandai's Yu-Gi-Oh cards were cut much smaller, 59x86mm instead of the 63x88mm size used for standard playing cards. Future properties that wanted to take advantage of the Cardass distribution model like Bandai's Digital Monster Card Game and Battle Spirits would also size their cards according to these dimensions, creating what many Western distributors call the Japanese size or mini size card standard. Bandai and Toei's partnership with Shueisha was not to last. During the course of the Toei anime's run, Takahashi and his publisher were approached by video game developer Konami to create a licensed Yu-Gi-Oh! game based on the manga's Capsule Monster Chess, a figurine game inspired by the Vilgust Gachapon toys of the early 1990s. It made sense for Konami to do it. They were an established video game developer and a regular sponsor of Toei's Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, frequently appearing in the credits for episodes as having provided funding. Their PlayStation adaptation of Capmon, titled Yu-Gi-Oh! Monster Capsule Breed in Battle, was well received in Japan, selling over 80,000 copies in its launch week according to Famitsu Magazine and over 255,000 units by the end of the year, becoming the 46th best-selling game of 1998 in Japan, right behind Tales of Fantasia and Banjo-Kazooie. However, the real star of that year wasn't Breed in Battle. It was the game Konami made after it. With every sealed Breed and Battle disc, Konami packed in a set of holographic Magic and Wizards cards. Not officially licensed Bandai cards, but Konami made cards modeled directly after the manga. After the success of Capsule Monsters Breed and Battle, Konami approached Takahashi and Shueisha to license a second game adapting the trading card game and the ongoing Duelist Kingdom arc of the manga, this time for the Game Boy which thanks to the then recent success of Pokemon Red, Green, and Blue, had much greater market penetration with Yu-Gi-Oh!'s elementary school target demographic than the PlayStation did. They called their adaptation Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters, and it opened two weeks before Christmas at number one with 683,948 units sold, beating out the launches of Crash Bandicoot 3, the Pokemon trading card game for Game Boy Color, Mario Party, and Atelier Ellie. By the end of the year, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters was the seventh best-selling game of 1998 at 973,800 copies, outdoing The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Pokemon Stadium, and Xenogears, and coming in just behind Parasite Eve. At the end of 1999, it had sold over 1.5 million copies, putting it in the top 40 best-selling Game Boy games of all time. There was just one problem. Magic and Wizards kinda sucked. It was a game created to tell a story, not to be interesting to play. In Takashi's initial rules, there was no resource system to manage as in Magic or Pokemon, or real sense of counterplay or deception as in Moncole. It was a game of just putting down the biggest beat stick you could, pumping it up with magic cards and hoping they don't have mirror force, and it wasn't until very late in the Duelist Kingdom arc that a real sense of counterplay emerged with cards like Grave Robber and Harpy's Feather Duster. The rules had some interesting concepts, like every monster having what Magic the Gathering would call trample, but without the monster illustrations to carry it, there wasn't much to the game that couldn't already be found in Magic or Pokemon. Think about what Kaiba does in the very first game he ever plays with Yugi. He pairs up Minotauros with Giant Growth to increase its attack by 20% and hack through all of Yugi's monsters. What does Yugi do in response? Does he come up with a spell that will negate Kaiba's? Does he find a way to remove Minotauros from the board or redirect its attacks? No, he top decks the summoned demon- I'm sorry, summoned Skull, which just so happens to be a bigger vanilla than Kaiba's monster. Shonen Jump's readership was very young, and very excited about a game that was very boring, and we can't really blame them for that because they were 10 and also probably putting Ember, Flamethrower, and Fire Blast all on the same Charizard. Moreover, many of the early rules of the game were unclear, and effects like percentage increases or evasion chances were hard to implement on a card-by-card -card basis. So to adapt Magic and Wizards into a video game, Konami created a more straightforward rule set and adapted a limited selection of cards from the manga alongside their original designs. The result was the first Dual Monsters rule set, where direct attacks on the opponent were allowed if they had no monsters to defend them, each player started with 8,000 life points to compensate for the direct attacks, and each player could only play one card from hand every turn. This last rule was Konami's first attempt at overcoming one of the major weaknesses of Takahashi's rules, that it had no actual mana or energy system constraining the player's actions. Seemingly, their sole limitation in the manga was only being able to play a single monster per turn. The first Duel Monsters rule set instead forced players to choose between scaling up their board presence by playing monsters and using magic effects to change the flow of the game. 
Finding information about this period of development is difficult, because Konami created and maintains one of the strictest non-disclosure agreements in the entire industry. Both designers and card artists are forbidden from displaying their work on personal websites, or even admitting they worked on the card game, and the company tightly controlled public relations to ensure no publications interviewed the game's team, as had happened with Pokemon. Even some of the Yu-Gi-Oh! video games like Eternal Duelist Soul have no credit sequence, bringing back a practice of not crediting game developers that hadn't been used since the Atari age of the 1970s. What we do know is that Duel Monsters 1 was designed, directed, and programmed by Yamada Nobuhiro and Chida Takuri, who would go on to serve similar roles on the next seven Duel Monsters games. If Yamada and Chida did not work on the card game, then it was at least inspired by the rules they created for the Game Boy adaptation. The physical card game retained the 8,000 life point rules, limitations on monster summoning, and had a similar if not identical card pool and set of effects, with equip magic cards and field magic cards now providing predefined attack and defense bonuses rather than percentage increases. The magic cards of the Game Boy game didn't create much of an opportunity for counterplay. None of the monsters in the game had effects at this point. They were all interchangeable beat sticks, so high-end play in Duel Monsters 1 revolved around using the fusion mechanic to field summoned skulls as quickly as possible. Fusion in the manga required a specific magic card to do, but in Konami's adaptation, fusion was simply done by playing a monster over another to create a new one that would last until the end of the duel. Summoned Skull was the monster of choice, because it had the second highest attack in the game and could be made using relatively easily farmed materials, the Embryonic Beast and Time Wizard. One copy of Embryonic Beast was included in the game's starter deck, and more could be obtained by dueling Bakura at a 1.61% drop rate, while Time Wizard could be farmed off Jonochi at a 0.49% drop rate. Summoned Skulls were supplemented by once-per-game copies of Blue-Eyes White Dragon, Red-Eyes Black Dragon, Gaia the Fierce Knight, and Curse of Dragon, and whatever other high-attack monsters players could get their hands on. Red-Eyes Black Dragon was particularly important because it could further fuse with Summoned Skull to create Black Demon's Dragon, the strongest monster in the game. The most powerful monster and magic cards like Kaen Jigoku were held back by being obtainable only once per save file through arcane requirements like dueling 200 different people over Link Cable, while less powerful but still game-changing cards like Swords of Revealing Light required farming incredibly low random drop rates from computer opponents. Unlike in the manga itself, this first implementation of Yu-Gi-Oh! had no limits on how many duplicates of a card could be in a deck, so without these restrictions it would be possible to build a deck of 20 Kai and Jigoku and 20 Millennium Shields to burn the opponent to death with. The readily accessible magic cards weren't particularly interactive either. You had Raigeki to clear the opponent's board, Dark Hole because Raigeki could only be obtained twice, Dragon Capture Jar to remove the opponent's high-tier dragons, Stop Defense to force an opponent to take battle damage, and an assortment of equip and field magic cards that provided minor boosts to attack and defense to create tiebreakers between otherwise evenly matched monsters. Cards couldn't be set for later use like in the manga, so there were no trap cards, no effects that interrupted or preemptively countered magic and traps, and thus next to no interaction. It was a bare-bones grind that expected players to duel the same computer opponents a hundred times each and then farm random drops from them so they could try to have bigger numbers than their friends, and a million kids bought into it, some of which actually entered the national championship for the Game Boy game. There were a lot of bad trading card games published between 1997 and 99, most of which only lasted one or two booster sets, but somehow the most boring one of all was the one that sold the most. One positive addition Konami made to the rules was the introduction of face-down monster positions. In the manga chapters up to this point, monster cards were always played face-up, and only magic and trap cards had been shown being set face-down, largely as a way to create dramatic tension and foreshadow counterplays. Konami took this idea and applied it to monster positions so that players could try to either bluff their opponent into not attacking a face-down defense mode monster, or surprise them with a high defense wall that caused their attack to backfire. Duel Monsters 1 had a lot of ideas, most of which were not very well implemented. But kids ate it up, and it was obvious from launch week that a sequel would be greenlit. By the time Duel Monsters launched in December 1998, the Toei anime had already been in reruns for two months, and a half-hour theatrical film was set to debut alongside Toei's Digimon Adventure movie on March 6th. Bandai's final licensed expansion to its Yu-Gi-Oh! card game was also in production, ready to go out to vendors in January, but the writing was on the wall for them. Konami had done more for the Yu-Gi-Oh! IP in one week than other licensors had done in a year, and so Takahashi and Shueisha entrusted the card game license to them, while also approving Game Boy Color and PlayStation sequels to Duel Monsters. 
Konami would deliver on those games in July and December 1999, with Duel Monsters 2, Dark Duel Stories, and Yu-Gi-Oh! Shin Duel Monsters, Forbidden Memories. As for the card game, Konami had their work cut out for them. The publisher's blessing was not enough. As poorly conceived as Bandai's take was, it was popular, and they had every reason to want to renew their license. The upcoming movie was sure to give a bump to sales of Bandai's licensed merch, and there was little doubt that the movie would be a smash hit when it was part of the biannual Toei Anime Fair, an extremely popular spring and summer event destination for families and children. Moreover, other licensees including Meiji, Marusho, and Top Seika had created cards of their own, largely modeled on the Toei anime series. There was real risk of market confusion, as well as losing the faith of Shueisha and Takahashi if their card game did not live up to the expectations the video games had set. Konami needed to secure their position and ensure they would hold the Yu-Gi-Oh card license for the long term. So, to establish their game as the official trading card game amid a flood of other licensees, Konami named their game the Yu-Gi-Oh Official Card Game, or OCG, and integrated OCG into their trademarks and branding. Other licensees could print all the cards they wanted, but Konami's game would be the only official one. When the OCG was later imported to the United States by Upper Deck Entertainment, it was called the Yu-Gi-Oh! Trading Card Game, or TCG. This was the beginning of a long-standing shorthand in the Western world, where OCG was casually used to refer to the Japanese version of a game and TCG to the English version, even though OCG has never been used as an official term by any company other than Konami. The launch lineup for the OCG focused on three major products. The starter box, that would provide two ready-made decks for players to learn the rules with, and the first two expansions, named Volume 1 and Booster 1. Volume 1 was distributed in booster boxes like a Magic or Pokemon set, while Booster 1 was distributed exclusively for Cardass vending machines licensed from Bandai. Unlike in other card games, the starter box did not launch simultaneous to the expansion packs in January. Rather, the starter box would launch on March 6th, the same day as the premiere of Toei's Yu-Gi-Oh! theatrical film, and would even be sold in the theaters as kids were coming out of the movie. The starter box itself focused on the manga, featuring Takashi's Duelist Kingdom art on the cover rather than Toei's anime art, and coming with a set of six star chips to reinforce the manga connection. Starter boxes were sent out to regular card shops two weeks later, after the fair had ended, and it was later reprinted in December 1999 and November 2000, before being used as the basis for the Yugi and Kaiba starter decks in the localized English TCG. Konami's ploy worked brilliantly. Having successfully transitioned the established Yu-Gi-Oh! audience to their brand, the resulting demand for the cards made it possible for them to release a new expansion every other month, eventually transitioning to monthly releases, something even Pokemon hadn't achieved. Part of that success came from applying the video game's Duel Monsters branding to the card game, and another was in the way it simultaneously targeted multiple demographics. By stocking the game in card-ass machines, Konami coded it as something for children to enjoy, and presented the game with descriptive effects like raise a water monster's attack and defense by 300 points, complete with an exclamation point on the end. At the same time, they went after the core base of TCG players using the Volume Series product line and created multiple rule sets to make both casual and core players feel welcome. At launch, the OCG had one rule set, the Kosiki, or Official Rules. But four months later, Konami introduced the Ekusupato Ruru, or Expert Rules, in the Duel Monsters Official Guidebook. The primary difference between them was that in Expert Rules, duelists could not simply play powerful monsters from their hand freely. Monsters with 5 or more level stars required tributes to play, with 5 and 6 star monsters requiring 1 tribute, while 7 and up required 2. In addition to these, expert rules allowed players to set as many magic or trap cards face down each turn as they wanted, while under official rules they could only play 1 magic and 1 trap card each turn, and in the official rules all trap cards stayed on the field after activation, unless their text specifically said to destroy them after use. This resulted in some early cards like Pitfall being worded differently in their first Japanese prints, specifying to destroy the card after it finished resolving. Both rule sets enforced a minimum 40 card deck size with no upper limit and up to three copies of any card in a deck, an idea carried over from Takashi's manga, where the rule was used to create drama. In the manga, there were four copies of Blue-Eyes White Dragon in the world, and antagonist Kaiba Seto ripped up the one belonging to Yui's grandpa so that the card could never be used against him. 
The official rules were intended to closely replicate the manga and create an approachable card game that even beginners could play with little to no explanation, while the expert rules were intended for advanced players and the core TCG audience supporting card shops. This matched up with Konami's product line, so that the Vending Machine Booster series catered to the official rules and the sealed box model of the Volume series appealed to expert rule players. The official rules were discontinued in late April of 2000, and a revised form of the expert rules was made the sole format of the Yu-Gi-Oh! official card game, with Takahashi coordinating with Konami by introducing a variation of the expert rules with 4,000 life points to the Battle City arc of his manga. When the OCG was localized as the English-language Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG in 2002, the Koshiki rules were not localized at all, and the revised expert rules were made the only format. So what was playing under the official rules like? Well, according to the duelists that lived through that period, not very fun. Before the starter box came out, the game primarily revolved around drawing Black Magician or the Dark Knight Gaia, with their only real counters being the board wiping Black Hole, the trap card Pitfall, or your own copy of those monster cards with equip magic on them. After the starter box hit, the game became incredibly dependent on its card pool, with both Blue Eyes White Dragon and the field clearing Thunderbolt originating from it. In response to Blue Eyes, some players tried to use the trap card Dragon Capture Jar to force it into defense mode, but even in defense mode, Blue Eyes had as much defense as the Black Magician had attack. The only thing that could destroy it by battle was another Blue Eyes. Dragon Capture Jar thus wasn't actually practical, and players instead used Pincer Attack to deal with Blue Eyes, destroying two of their monsters to destroy one of the opponents. This was an immense negative trade in terms of card advantage, giving up three cards to destroy one, but it was run anyway because there were so few ways to deal with a Blue Eyes White Dragon. This was essentially a one deck format, with players running the highest power monsters they could find and three copies each of Black Hole, Pitfall, Thunderbolt, Pincer Attack, and sometimes Equip Magic cards. Early in the game's life, there was not a steady supply of singles available for purchase at store counters, in part because of the younger skew of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s player base over monster collection or magic, so players generally only had what they could pull from packs. As a result of all this, the official rules weren't particularly skillful compared to the other card game formats going on at the time. When Volume 3 launched in Japan and introduced the first effect monsters, the Moncole TCG was in its golden age, about a year away from the first set rotation, while the Pokemon trading card game was in the Challenge from Darkness expansion, and players were contending with Dark Vileplume Trainer Locks and Dark Plume's counter card Muck, along with hand destruction via Imposter Oak's Revenge, the Rocket's Trap, and Rocket's Sneak Attack. In comparison to the depth of cards like Brock's Nine Tails or Counter Ritual, the OCG official rules made for an excessively non-interactive game. But in its defense, it was at least a game that let the other player play, without the high investment demanded by Pokémon's then nearly three years old format. It's not exactly surprising, then, that once Moncole scared most of its player base off with the first set rotation in 2000, the players went to Yu-Gi-Oh! rather than Pokémon. Konami created a line of organized competitive events to increase their game's visibility and demonstrate a commitment to it that competing licensees had not. The first of these was the 1999 Duel Monsters National Tournament, which took place in Ginza on February 21st and used the original Game Boy game rather than the physical trading cards. While the tournament was for the Game Boy game, Konami handed out the promo card Kanan the Sword Mistress to promote the OCG. Roughly 400 people attended nationals, with the winners receiving steel-plated cards as trophies. The first official tournament for the OCG itself would be held roughly half a year later. In the meantime, local stores began holding small tournaments of their own, just as they had for Pokémon and Monster Collection. The launch of Volume 2 on March 27th brought with it a long-awaited magic card, Shisa Solse, what would later be officially localized as Monster Reborn. Monster Reborn revived one monster from either player's graveyard, allowing a player to either bring back a Blue Eyes their opponent had destroyed, or take control of their opponent's Blue Eyes after destroying it. And because Monster Reborn was a 1 for 1 exchange while the various means of dealing with Blue Eyes were mostly 2 or 3 for 1, it helped solidify how just getting a Blue Eyes out in any form could represent an unequal trade with the opponent. Yu-Gi-Oh! did not have a formal resource system, but it still had an implicit one. The cards one exchanged in the process of damaging the other player. Another key card from the set was the Swords of Revealing Light, which stopped the opponent from declaring attacks for three turns and flipped all of their face-down monsters face up. While this was an effective spell card, it was made even more effective by how card rulings worked under the original official rules. 
Until August, Swords of Revealing Light was a normal magic card that went to the discard pile after use, and its effect lingered on the field, while after the rules were revised, it stayed on the field as a permanent magic card, and destroying it would end its effect. Before it was made into a permanent magic card, there was no actual way to counter it. The opponent put it on the board, it went to the graveyard, and the effect persisted even though it wasn't on the field. May 5th was a turning point for the OCG. On this day, Konami officially unveiled the Expert rules as an alternative format, both in the Duel Monsters guidebook and in the rule cards packed in with the vending machine packs found in the Booster Series product line. The Expert rules were officially adopted for the OCG's National Championship, and gradually became the primary format for the card game. The introduction of tributes, where monsters had to be sacrificed to normally summon high-level monsters, effectively added the monoscrew of Magic the Gathering into Yu-Gi-Oh! Now it was possible to draw a hand of nothing but 5-star or higher monsters, and not be able to play anything at all. Players had to carefully ration their ratio of low-level to high-level monsters according to a curve, so that they would be able to consistently play 4-star and lower monsters on the first turn, and then sacrifice them for high-level ones 1-2 to two turns later. This coincided with Konami's first formal ban list for the game, published on July 8th and adopted for Nationals in August. This list limited three cards to being one per deck, Thunderbolt, Black Hole, and Pitfall. Under the earlier official rules, these cards were the only real counters to Blue Eyes, but with Blue Eyes White Dragon now effectively dead in the format for being a two-tribute monster, these cards were overly punishing to the rest of the game. The expert rules were a shocking shift for Yu-Gi-Oh's fledgling competitive community. Many cards that were underplayed or nearly useless under the Koshiki rules became deck staples in the Expert era, and vice versa. For example, Curse of Dragon from Volume 2 suddenly became one of the most powerful cards in the Japanese metagame, because it was a single tribute monster with 2000 attack power, while the Dark Knight Gaia virtually disappeared for being a two tribute monster with only 2300 attack points. Next to Blue Eyes and Black Magician, Gaia wasn't even worth considering. Decks were now primarily made up of low-level monsters, with Wild Raptor, a common from Volume 2, becoming a deck staple for being a 4-star monster with 1500 attack. And while this shift had already been ongoing, the expert rules also pushed the game further towards defensive 4-star monsters like Holy Elf, Spirit of the Harp, and Aqua Mador with 2000 defense. The expert rules thus marked a transition point, one which required reflection on the existing card pool, and a recalibration of what was considered the best in the format. It was from this point that Yu-Gi-Oh! began to become a more skillful game, one where players needed to play smart to play well, and also from here that the franchise would really grow into a massive phenomenon. That transition took several months to run its course, as players were still playing with standard rules much of the time, but by the end of the August National Championship, Expert rules would be the law of the land.